more. One more time. All right. Boy, I'm at the right church at the right time. Amen. You may be seated. Well, what a great honor it is to be here today. I can't tell you how I look forward to what is taking place at this church. My, the worship is just unbelievable today. The building has never looked better than it looks now. The congregation has never been as good looking as it is now. Amen. All right. But it is a great honor to be here. You know, it's good to be someplace where they know you. I go through airports all the time, and I see people kind of looking at me, and, and they, they talk and they whisper. I know what's going to happen. In a few minutes, they come up, and somebody says, did anybody ever tell you that you look like Jerry Jones? <laughs> now, folks, that, that's bad enough. But recently, I was in Milwaukee waiting to be picked up to take to church. A little lady walked up to me while I was paying for my food. And she said, sir, did anybody ever tell you that you look like, and I knew she was going to say Jerry Jones, so I was ready. I said, Brad Pitt. <laughs> she laughed, I laughed, everybody laughed. And then she looked, I said, seriously, Pastor, I thought well, here it comes. Did anybody ever tell you that you look like President Biden? <laughs> and I said, come on, man, amen. You see, when you get my age, everybody looks alike. <laughs> we just all look alike. But it's such a great word to be here with all you wonderful people today. And you got to forgive me if I'm just a little melancholy. Because, you know, I've been at this church many, many years. I was way back in the Crimson area. I, I even preached for him before that when he was at San Jose. Matter of fact, this coming month in, our, in October... I will be sick, how old, oh, 87 years of age. That means that I've been preaching the gospel, are you ready, for 70 years. I started when I was 17 years of age. You know, I, I've been married to the same old gal for 58 years, amen. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather fight than switch, amen. My beautiful wife, I met her, she got saved one of my revivals. She came over to fly for Scandinavian Airlines. And I said, after she got saved, baby, forget Scandinavian Airlines and come fly with me, amen. Stand up, Maria, turn around, face up. So my beautiful wife, she was 10 years of age when I married her, amen. I checked up the other day and I've preached over 30,000 messages in my lifetime. Alone just from American Airlines right now, I have uh, 6 million miles. So really, there's a lot of miles on this whole body. But one of the reasons I'm a little melancholy is because I truly love this church. I thank God for what you stand for. I've been here and preached on several occasions, but I've never seen it more healthy and more vibrant and everything just moving like a clock than it is right now. And I want you to know that over at the, excuse me, the Phoenix campus, there's not one of the 12 churches in the network that we're more proud of are as proud of as this church right now. That's true. Don't you know that? It's a bright spot. It's the bright spot. <laughs> Luke, when he heard I was coming, always said, tell him I love him. Tell the pastor and, and his wife, Lindsay, that we love them so much. Pastor Oscar, there you are. I want you to know that we're so proud of you. When, when you speak at the staff meeting every week, our ears just tune in. You and your wife, aren't they doing a great job? Amen. And I see why after being here today. But you know, I got, to, before I speak, just briefly, I'm not going to speak, because I've only got 50 of these books. It's my biography of my life. It's entitled, 
what if. And I'm going to speak about some of it in my sermon here today. This book is recently published, and uh, John Maxwell called me about 9 o'clock one night. If you know John Maxwell, he's a book man. He said, somebody gave me your book, and I just had to call you. I usually read a chapter, but he said, I couldn't lay it down. I read the entire book, Pastor. And of all the books I've ever read of him, this one has inspired me like I've never been inspired. It's a novel form. It will start as a small boy born in Electra, Texas, on the Widener Ranch. My granddad was a little pumper. We couldn't afford to go to the hospital, so I was born in a house. You're going to love this book. I, I urge you all to get it. I'm sorry I couldn't bring more, but my wife and I are going to be back here to sign your book for a little while. We're trying three services, you know. I know it goes fast here. and uh, But I'm, I'm not going to sign it, but I'm going to give you a hug. Now, if you're not a hugger, buy the book and run. Because I'm going to tackle you right in the lobby and hug you. Amen. That's all the announcements. Everybody, it's glad they're over. Say a good amen. amen. Most sinners feel that way. Amen. When I go out and speak at pastor conferences, which I do about every week, we have a moment in which I say, you have any questions? And people can ask us any questions they'd like, and we'll try to answer them. Recently, I was at a conference, a fellow stood up, said, Pastor, I have a question. What is the secret of your success? He said, you've told us a lot of things that you believe and you're doing, but you haven't really touched it yet. What do you think it is? She said, he said, you're not the greatest Bible scholar in the world. He said, you're not even the greatest preacher I've ever heard. He said, you don't have that a good voice. It's kind of an old raspy voice. He said, you're not very charming or handsome. And I said, sit down and shut up. <laughs> Everybody laughed. I laughed. And then he said, no, Pastor. I want you to be honest with us. Why, why do you think that God has used you like he's used you? He said, you're a miracle. And I thought about that a minute. And I tried to start to contradict it. But it hit me. You are looking at a miracle. Now, if I said I was a miracle worker, that would be wrong because I'm not, you're not, nobody's a miracle worker. God's a miracle worker. But when I say I'm a miracle, I can say it because God took the most unlikely person and used him. So I'm a product of the handiwork of God. And everyone in this building can be a miracle if you'll just do what God tells us in his word. And I think today, I have come the nearest reason, and I want to share it with you today. Hebrews 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might find mercy and find grace for help in the time of need. I think today, if you'll listen closely, I could show you something that could change your life today. So, Holy Spirit, I do not ask for the joy of preaching a great message, but I have a great truth. And I pray, God, that this truth will come alive and lives will be changed by your power. In Jesus' name, amen. God never gives starting grace. But what he does, once we get started, he sends grace along the way. There are too many people saying, I, I'm going to wait for God to move until I move. And God is saying, no, you're not going to hear from me until you move. There's too many people saying, I'm not going to move until God shows up. And God says, I'm not going to show up until you move. Now, we've got to understand how grace along the way works. Grace works when our faith kicks in. You see, God is a responder God. He says the first move is up to you. Matthew 7 and verse 7, ask, that's your part. And you shall receive, and it shall be given unto you. That's God's part. 
Seek, that's your part, and you shall find. Knock, that's your part, and it shall be open unto you. Luke 6 and verse 38. Give, that's your part, and it shall be given to you. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 6. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. That's your part, to acknowledge him. And the next verse is God's part, and he will direct your path. You see, God is waiting on you to do something. God is waiting for you to move. God is waiting for you to go after the dream, the vision, the purpose for which he put you in your life. But he does not give you starting grace. But he waits till we get started for me to move towards the vision. <laughs> and we don't even know how God brought us to the place that we are. I can explain to you. I'm asking again and again. Where did you get the money for the Dream Center? Did you know it took $50 million just to bring it up to code? We had no church supporting us. If you would ask me, and it takes a million one every single year, month, I'm sorry. That's our budget, and nobody supports us. Someone said, Pastor, how did the money come in? And I thought, I don't know. One guy said, are the kids selling drugs? I thought, no, I never thought of it. No, 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 no. <laughs> we don't even know how we got where we are today because it's a miracle walk. But here's something I've discovered. I've discovered that every time I'm moving, God is moving. Every time I step out and get myself in trouble, God looks down. And said, well, Barnett's done it again. i got to bail him out. In Matthew chapter 9, Jairus is having a tough decision to make in his life. He's a very religious man. He takes care of the temple. And now his daughter, who is 12 years of age, is at the point of death. He has this tough decision to make. He said, if I stay with my daughter, I know she's going to die. But if I go to where Jesus is, she might just live. Follow me closely. What faith guarantees is this? I don't know whether God is in this thing or not. I'm not sure that he's going to bless it. But I'll never know unless I step out in faith. I'll never know. That grace along the way will be there until I get there. It's akin to the story in 2 Kings chapter 7. You all know about the four lepers that are at the gate. They're starving. And they say, if we stay here, we're going to die at the gate. If we go back to Jerusalem, we're going to die. But then they raise this question. What if? And by the way, that's what the book is about. What if? It's not looking back at the past and saying, what if I'd have done that? It's looking at the future and saying, what if? What if one day I ask, if I'd buy a bus, would people ride it and come to church? Then we bought them. Then we bought 10. And then we bought 20. We end up with 47 buses, bringing 3,000 people to church. But it scared me. What if? One day I... I was offered by George Woods, the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God, an opportunity, please come to L.A. It looked crazy because we're pastoring the largest church in the Assemblies of God in Phoenix. But he said, what if you'd come? What if you'd leave here and come to L.A.? What if? What if? I was scared to death. But I asked myself, what if we'd go? So I couldn't get a good pastor, so I got Matthew. Amen. 20 year old boy, never preached before. And we said, What if we just go to LA? And these leopards said, What if we go to the enemy's camp? Here's how faith works. I don't know. I might live, I might die. But one thing is for sure if I stay where I'm at, I'm going to die. And the Word of God says, They decided at twilight to go to the enemy's camp. And 
as they went to the enemy's camp, the enemy heard a noise. It sounded like chariots. It sounded like armies. It sounded like they were being invaded. They didn't hear it, but the enemy heard it. And as they were moving, the Bible said, moving, 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 moving to the enemy camp, God caused the enemy to run. So the very moment that their faith kicked in, so did God's grace and mercy. And let me stop right here to say, they went to the enemy's camp. That's where the miracles take place. We hear stories about people coming back from Africa, and they tell us the lame walk and the dumb talk and the blind saw, and people were even raised from the dead. And we never see that in America. I don't never see anybody raised from the dead. But miracles take place in miracle territory. And such was the case in L.A. Downtown L.A. is a troubled spot in the world, literally. And the Dream Center is right in the heart of L.A. In the early part of the Dream City ministry, there was a little lady and her daughter who heard about the Dream Center. In, uh, they, they were back in Gibney. And they were destitute. They were dying because they had no food. She had just enough money to get on a bus and come to the Dream Center. We have instructions at that time. There was a certain time that we would not let people in. We cl closed registration. So if people would live at the Dream Center, they could not register till the next morning. Well, they showed up. It was past the time. They said to the little lady, she said, well, if you'll turn out tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll get you registered and try to check you in. But she said, we have no money. We have no place to stay. So the little lady began to call the hotels that would pay for her and her daughter a place to stay that night. The next morning, they showed up. As she was checking them in, the little girl who was educated very, very slow, and he played a little game, her and her mother. It was hide and seek. And so while she was being registered, she asked if she could go to the restroom, and we pointed her down the hall to the restroom. But as if you've ever been to the Dream Center, you know it's built on the side of a hill, right? And you can enter in the sixth floor at one level or the lower level at the bottom floor. They came in the sixth floor. So the little girl said, I'm going to hide from Mama. She went to the restroom. And she said, I'm going to jump out of the window and she'll never find me. She was six stories up and didn't know it. <laughs> she crashed to the ground six stories. We heard a scream. Everybody knows you don't survive falling six stories to the, to the sidewalk. We rushed her to the hospital. They began to do tests upon her. They kept her a day and a half and found out all she had was a little cracked lip. I'm trying to tell you that miracles happen in miracles territory. <laughs> she could have been killed. It could have been the end of the dream center. But I, some of you are not getting it yet. So I'm going to show you how grace works by using the metaphor of American football. How many of you like football? Put your hand up real high. How many of you don't give a flip about it? Could I see your hand? That's why I'm here. God called me to line you folks up. Get you right with God today. Amen. Okay. Jesus Christ is the quarterback. So for lack of somebody better, I'm going to be the quarterback here today. The football, and by the way, can I have this football? Is that all right? <laughs> the football is the blessing. It's the miracle that you need in your life. And you guys are going to be the wide receivers. Some of you are wider than others. Hey, oh, excuse me. Amen. Now, your job as a wide out is to get off the line of scrimmage. Because the enemy, the devil knows, as long as you're on the line of scrimmage, you'll never do any damage unto the kingdom of God. As long as you're talking about what you're going to do and you never do it, there'll be no damage to the kingdom of God. 
So he calls you into the huddle. And Jesus says, the devil's trying to stop us. So what I need you to do is find a way to get off of the line of scrimmage. So he says, when the ball is hiked, which is what? The blessing, the miracle that you need. I need you to fake right and run a post right up the middle. Because it's only when you get off of the line of scrimmage that you can do damage to Satan's kingdom. Now, I can't keep saying that I want a job and I never go job hunting. I can't keep saying that I want to be healed and I never get out of bed. I can't keep saying I want to be God's miracle, never get out of a boat to see if I can walk on water. But grace along the way says, Whatever I am believing for, I've got to go out and pursue. So I can see if God's mercy is going to kick it in. Now, folks, I have never had money to match the vision that God has given in my life. But I learned something. I've learned that money follows ministry. If I'll do the ministry, then God will send the money. I've never had the ability or the power to accomplish the vision. You see, you don't grow by subtraction. If you want to be strong, if you want to have a, a mighty body like you see up here, amen. It hurts me when you laugh that way. The way you get stronger is not taking weights off, but you add weight. You add, you don't subtract. Well, Pastor, I'm overworked at church. I can't be a body. Oh, shut up. <laughs> I never say that before. Excuse me. That must, somebody must have needed that. Amen. You grow by adding more. Never had the ability, never had the money, but I just kept on lifting, kept on lifting. Now, the quarterback waits for you to get to the spot. What he does, he throws it in anticipation to where you're supposed to be. He doesn't throw it based upon where you currently are. He throws that ball to where you should be, where you're supposed to be. Now, I have found that if I can get to the spot, God seems to show up every time with his grace and mercy. Here's the problem. Most of us have never got to the spot in the first place. When we went to L.A., I had the vision for 40 years before I went to L.A. for the dream center. I saw it 40 years before it happened, but nothing happened till I got there. And then money began to show up. Men who were making money, and they didn't even know me. We were making it for that moment. But I had to show up. You see, much of our trouble is that we haven't got to the spot. But here's the great thing about it. I got some good news. There's a thing in football called pain. Even though you go in the wrong direction, God will still keep the blessing and the miracle alive in the air till you get to the place you're supposed to be. Some of you haven't got it yet. So... I've asked Jimmy to help me uh, do this by catching the ball here in just a minute. Stand up, Jimmy. I, I was going to ask Kevin to do it, but I found out he was a soccer player. <laughs> and he was a fan of UCLA, and I knew he had dropped the ball. Amen. I, just knew. I knew he had dropped the ball every time. And so, Jimmy, he never fails. So, Jimmy, let's show them how grace along the way works. That ball hangs up there until we get to the spot. Hey! I know Kevin would have missed that, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. But listen closely. Here's what happened. You can get to the spot. You can get to the will of God. And you're walking towards the destiny that God puts in your life. 
And then you watch somebody stand up and give a testimony of how God gave them their miracle. And you tithed, and you were faithful, and you came to church, and you prayed, and you see them ahead of you in the line. Sometimes I believe that God delays the blessing to find out. Can you worship me when somebody else is prospering? Can you cheer for somebody else? Can you celebrate their blessing with their life? And I've discovered that if I can shout for my brother and my sister and praise God for what he's doing in their life, I can understand that God is no respecter of persons. And if I can rejoice for them, it'll come to me. I better illustrate one more time. My mother, my dad used to take us to a place like McDonald's or wherever an old McDonald's then. And we'd all order you know, what was on the menu, number one, number two, number three. But when it came to my mother, she would always talk. And we thought, oh, no, here we go. I want a hamburger but I do not want lettuce or tomatoes. I want pickles, jalapeno peppers, and mayonnaise. Now, let me just say, my mother was a godly woman, but you do not put mayonnaise on a hamburger. If you put mayonnaise on, you're not right with God. I just want to tell you <laughs> right now. You put mustard. Could I hear the mustard people say amen? I want to hear the mayonnaise people. If you have... I knew God sent me here for a reason. I knew it. I knew it. Now, we know what's going to happen. The guy's going to say, sorry, ma'am, we haven't got yours in order right now. We'll have to delay. Just pull over to the side. And while we are waiting on her to get her menu, there are people behind us pulling up when we were there first. We were the first one there, and we're still waiting. The question is... How can I celebrate folks behind me picking up their blessing when I was waiting and I was there first? And we say, God, why? And God says, because what you ask for is not ready yet. So he says, pull up. I've got to work your stuff out because what you're asking for, I don't have in stock right now. You ask for a special order. You ask for a husband who loves God, who's saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit, and looks like Brad Pitt. I, I haven't got him ready yet. I'm working on him right now. Pull up and wait. Oh, God, I'm desperate. I'll take anybody. And that's what you end up with. Amen. But when you ask for something special, woo, God may still be working on the perfect will of God. But I've learned something. I've learned the importance of seed faith. Turn to the one beside you and say, you better be good to me. I'm just a seed right now. Amen. Someday you may have to borrow money from me. Amen. I'm not what I'm going to be. I'm just a seed. I want to close. I could just preach all day, but time is very valuable in this early service. Some of you just can't wait to get to McDonald's after the service. Eh? Look at me just a minute. There have been three occasions in my life ever big. I want to tell you about them real briefly. The first one was my first pastor in Davenport, Iowa. I had 75 people one day. went there, 75 of the meanest people you've ever seen in your life. Amen. Very legalistic type of people. But we begin to love people and begin to reach out and run buses. And we grew and became the fastest growing church in America. We grew in eight years from 76 to over 4,000 and was awarded America's fastest growing church. We beat the Baptists, amen. I love to beat the Baptists. Because of that, I was invited to speak at a lot of different churches. 
I was invited to Nashville, Tennessee to preach for Jimmy Snow, who was the country singer Hank Knowles' son who had accepted Christ. I got up to preach, and I looked down the aisle, and in walked two people, June and Johnny Cash. I preached my heart out that day. I preached, oh, what should it profit a man if he's gained the world and lose his soul? When it's over, I met with them, and they said, we're going to come back here. We need God. We need, we're going to think it over. And the next Sunday, they came back. In the regular service, I was back at my own church, and they gave their lives to Christ. So I had a vision. When he came to Phoenix to perform, I went to the concert, and when it was over, I walked back to a little door, and I knew that door, he was behind it. There was just a curtain in front. I said to the guard, will you tell Mr. Cash, there's a Tommy Barnett here that wants to see him. I didn't know if he would remember or not. He was right behind the curtain. I heard him say, let the reverend in. I went in and said, I've got a dream. What if? I'd like to have the world's greatest Sunday school. I'd like to beat my friend, Dr. Jerry Falwell. Because he just had one at baseball stadium and had 20,000 people. I said, why don't you come and we'll have a Sunday school. We'll call it the world's greatest Sunday school in the baseball stadium. And you sing and I'll preach. I said, would you pray about it? He said, I'll come. Expected him to pray about it. Amen. To make a long story short, he came. He brought two semi trucks, a sound system. He brought the entire caravan. The guy did blue suede shoes. I'll pray. He brought the singers. He brought his band. He brought the PA system. And that day, I preached for about 15 minutes to over 30,000 people. And I gave the invitation while Johnny Cash sang, from home, come home, it's so good. Over 6,000 people came down to the front. You talk about millions. It looked like a Billy Graham crusade. I said, oh God, I can't believe this. I walked out of the place. My wife and I were so stirred, I was weeping. Never expected in my lifetime to see anything like this. This is like a Billy Graham crusade. When a little guy met me in the parking lot, he said, Pastor, I've never seen anything like this in my life. You're amazing. Your church is amazing. I never expected to see anything like this in my life. But then he pointed at his finger and said, I was stirred, but, but you can do more. Fast forward. I'm now at Phoenix. We just finished building our 5,000-seat auditorium. I was scared to death. Would anybody be there? So I came to the side door, and I peeked inside. What I saw scared me to death. Every seat was filled. The entire balcony was filled. People were standing around the back. I was going to preach a message about the glory of the temple Talk about the gold cherubims and the, all these beautiful things with the temple. And God spoke to me and said, no, I don't want you bragging on this building. I want you to brag on me. And I preached on this subject of he. And he alone is altogether lovely. Let the building be destroyed. Let the buses be destroyed. God cut down the man behind the pulpit if he takes glory for it. I walked down the parking lot. The glory of God fell in the audience. It was like there was a mist. But guess who showed up? That little guy. He said, Pastor, I'm so proud of our church. I never thought I'd see anything like this in a church in my life. I'm so proud of God. I'm so proud of you and our church. Then he took his old bony finger and said, but you can do more. One more time. We came to L.A. We had nothing but a dream. But God miraculously moved. 
I thought in my lifetime I would never see the dream center paid for debt free. But five years ago, on the top of the building, we burnt the escrow. It took over $50 million besides the operation. You talk about moved. I got in the elevator. I came down. I walked out on the parking lot. I was lost. I was weeping and crying, God, I thought I'd die. Never seen the Dream Center paid for. And guess who showed up? The little guy. He said, Pastor, I never thought we'd see this paid for. I can't even believe they were existing over these 30 years. But then he took that old bony finger and he pointed at me and said, but you can live on. And I thought this message was a perfect message to preach at this church. You have been blessed. God has done great things in this place. You're becoming a pattern of good works for other churches throughout the country. But I want to say to everyone in this building, Where's Jim? There he is. That's a pretty good catch, buddy. But you can do more. You can do more. God is using you, but you can do more. The greeters can do more. The young people can do more. God is using you in Lindsay Center. God has given you people. But let me tell you, you can do more. Give the Lord a good clap off. And I want to be that horse guy. But every time God blesses you and does something in your life, I want you to hear my own can do more because he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think give the Lord a good clap off it right now oh thank you Jesus bow your heads quickly close your eyes how many in this building will say pastor while you preach God really moved on me pastor I need God and I need him now you see how God can give the life to somebody that will give his life to Christ? Pastor, I want that life. I want to know Jesus. I want to be sure that I'm right with God. Pastor, I don't like the life that I'm living. I want more from God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many will say, Pastor, would you pray for me in your closing prayer? I need God. I need him bad. Put your hand up right now. I need him to work right now. The doctor said it's fatal. The children have broken my heart. I'm losing my job. My marriage is in shambles. Now, you may put your hand down. Hands are all over this auditorium. All of them. I'm going to ask everyone to join in a prayer. It's called the prayer of repentance. And the Bible said when it's prayed with a genuine repentant heart that God hears and God forgives. Loud and strong, I want everybody. Christians, would you join in with those who are crying for mercy and for healing and for grace today? I want this prayer to sound like thunder. Are you ready? Loud and strong, repeat with me. Dear God, I need a Savior. I need forgiveness, Lord. You said that if I would ask you, that you would forgive me. Today I repent of my sin. And I give my life to you. I receive that more message. And I give my life totally to you. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a good clap. I love you all dearly. See you at the table. Man. What a word. I know that I'm going to live off of that for a while. I could, I could do more. And it's because of Jesus. We could do more, church. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand to your feet right now? We need this reminder. We're going to use the next few moments to remind ourselves that the grace along the way comes from one name, comes from one source. Let's get to where God's called us to be. Let's speak this name over our life over our kids, over our families, over our future. The only name that makes the darkness tremble, the name, the author, the perfecter of our faith, it's the name of Jesus. Come on, let's declare it over our life.